we have an incredible lineup of speakers, and it's a great one that I can begin introducing right now. <coughs> Larry Summers is the former Secretary of the Treasury for President Clinton, former director of the National Economic Council for President Obama when the economy nearly imploded, former president and president emeritus now of Harvard University, who isn't, and he's available now <coughs> via live video, and we're very, very grateful for him to give his time and share his thoughts with us today. Let's see if this works. Welcome, Larry. Hello, I'm glad to be with you. Thank you, Larry. Very, very, very glad to have you here. Should I be getting started? Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, let me just say that I am uh, sorry that my teaching schedule per, uh, precludes me from being with you at what feels like it's going to be a very important forum on a topic that I think is uh, central uh, to the future of our economy and uh, the future of our country. As fundamental as globalization uh, has been and uh, continues to be, I believe that the impact of technology on the workplace, on the distribution of income, on the way people live is likely to be even more profound. That is in part because I believe that technology is an ultimate driver of uh, globalization. If one thinks about the substantially accelerated convergence of many economies uh, in Asia, it is a reflection of economic reform in uh, those countries, but it is also, I've just lost the picture here, we can see you. Um, I have, uh, it is a reflection of uh, technological, uh, technological changes that are, uh, that permit much greater integration uh, than was uh, previously possible. You know, we are bound by our experience of the present in and the relatively recent past in thinking about uh, technology. Uh, ponder this, uh, economic historians debate the level of standards of living of GDP per person as best one can measure it in the Athens of Pericles and in the London of 1800. Some people believe standard of livings were about the same some people believe standards of living were 50% higher in London in 1800. No matter, that translates into a growth rate over 2,300 years measured in the low hundreds of a percentage point uh, per year. For most of human history, the idea that living standards would be higher at the end of a human lifespan than they were at the beginning of a human lifespan was an entirely alien and uh, fanciful notion. Indeed, the reason they called it the Industrial Revolution was that with growth rates emerging, not that rapid, at perhaps 1% a year or a little faster, for the first time in human history, living standards were different at the end of a human lifespan than they were at, the, than they were at uh, its inception. If living standards rose by a factor of 1.5 over a human lifespan during the Industrial Revolution, uh, it is hard to know what the right word is for what has happened in China over the last 35 years and much of Asia. At 7% a year, living standards double in a decade and again in a decade. And with a 70 year lifespan, if that were to continue, it would translate into growth in living standards of a hundredfold in a single human uh, lifespan. That is entirely without precedent in human history. And it is something that is uh, taking place 
across a large swath of humanity, a far larger fraction of the world than was touched by the Industrial Revolution in the first half of the 1800s. And so technology has produced uh, remarkable uh, achievements and convergence in uh, the developing world. So too, uh, in our own world, uh, here in the United States, one can debate the benefits of uh, material uh, prosperity. One can debate just how important the improvements in living standards, whether it's uh, greater levels of appliances or more space uh, in homes, that uh, people enjoy today relative to what they enjoyed a, a uh, generation ago. It is harder to debate that it is a substantial human achievement that life expectancy has been rising about three months every year for the last 50 years, and that uh, that trend is, if anything, uh, accelerating. And that means a tremendous improvement in human well-being, a tremendous reduction uh, in uh, human uh, suffering. And so whatever else is the right thing to say, I think it is very difficult to gainsay the importance of science and technology as uh, ultimate uh, drivers of uh, human well-being. Yes, the technology of terror has improved. Yes, the potential of weapons technology uh, has uh, greatly increased. On the other hand, it bears emphasis, as my colleague uh, at Harvard, Stephen Pinker, has emphasized in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, that if one looks at most measures of violence uh, and takes the long view, the trend is substantially downwards. And if one looks, for example, at the fraction of human beings killed in war, uh, it is today perhaps a fifth of the level that it was at in the 1970s. And that is no small achievement. No one really understands completely why that has happened, but I cannot believe but that uh, the answer is that technologies which make uh, suffering, make um, large-scale uh, impositions of terror much more globally visible than they ever were uh, before, contribute to the forces that uh, bring peace and undo uh, violence. The principal concern, though, of your conference is, I suspect, less with uh, the consequences of technology overall than with the consequences of uh, technology uh, for uh, working Americans, and probably especially for uh, working Americans uh, with uh, less skill. And this is indeed a profoundly um, vexing uh, question. And I don't um, presume uh, to be able to uh, foresee uh, the future. When I was an MIT undergraduate, uh, these issues loomed large. A group of distinguished social scientists and scientists had recently written a letter to President Johnson foreseeing the impact of a cybernetic revolution and automation that would uh, do away with a large part of the need for work and uh, pointing to the need for profound thinking about the social consequences of uh, such a uh, such a change. I was taught as an MIT undergraduate, uh, principally by the great economist Robert Solow, that 
this was largely uh, nonsense, that associated with greater prosperity might come some reduction in uh, the number of hours people worked and some increase in the demand for leisure, but there was nothing to condemn or worry about about that, that if the was that the idea that there wouldn't be any work to do because everything would be produced was a confusion that after all more work more more work more productivity would mean more income more income would mean more spending not all wants were being satisfied and that the increased productivity would generate its own wherewithal in terms of spending to cause people to be uh, fully employed. And that the idea that automation would uh, eliminate the demand for labor was uh, therefore a, a substantial confusion. It was uh, along with the Malthusian uh, confusion, the kind of thing that non-economists believed and economists knew better. That, if you had asked me 20 years ago about these matters, would uh, surely have been what I would have said uh, in some form. Today, I am not so sure. I uh, ask myself, uh, suppose the automation view had been correct in the 1960s. What would you expect to have seen over the last 45 years? you would have expected uh, to see that a large number of people would find that while they were possessed of the same physical and mental capacities that they or their ancestors had always possessed, that there was a substantial reduction in the demand for their labor. That as a consequence, if they wish to be employed, the wage they could earn was significantly lower than it had been in the past. That as a consequence of that wage being significantly lower, particularly in a welfare state, that they were less likely to supply labor. And so fewer of them were likely to be employed. And so if automation was having the kinds of concerns that one would expect, one would perhaps imagine that over time, the relative wage of less skilled workers would decline substantially, and it has. There are a million measurement issues, but few can gainsay the proposition that the relative wage of high school dropouts or even high school graduates without college has declined very substantially over the last 40 years. And at least on all the official statistical measures, it is substantially lower than it was 40 years ago. One would expect that as that process took place, that fewer people would decide uh, to work. And indeed, in the United States today, there are more middle-aged men on disability insurance than there are middle-aged men doing production work uh, in manufacturing. To put the point in a different way, uh, choosing a group of 25 to 54-year-old men, not because it's the most important group in the society, but because it's probably the group where there is the strongest universal social expectation that uh, people will be working, one finds uh, that one in 20 such men were not working in the 1960s, and that today, even after the economy reaches a cyclical peak, three in 20 will not be working, and that the trend uh, will uh, be upwards. The great economist Vasily Leontiev, writing 30 years ago, made the essential analytic uh, point uh, with an empirical comparison that has been rediscovered uh, a number of times uh, since Leontief called attention to it. He noted that a horse 
has all the same capacities that a horse had 100 years ago, all the same physical strength, all the same ability to lift and carry and move uh, and accelerate. And yet the number of horses that the economy is able to support is perhaps a tenth of what it was 100 years ago. If it is possible that that is the outcome for horses, one cannot preclude the possibility that it is the outcome for other kinds of workers. Fortunately, we live in a society where um, social constructs assume assume that small children will not be laboring. They assume that those uh, who are very aged will not be working. Can anyone doubt that if either of those groups had to support themselves by working in the market, that their wage would be significantly lower than it would have been uh, many years ago? And so, yes, it is reasonable to suppose that uh, technology may well be leading to uh, substantial changes in the relative productivity of different kinds of labor, and that that is going to lead to uh, profound uh, issues for our system of social insurance, for our system of uh, transfers. Uh, how we are going to address these issues, I think, is very much a question for the politics of uh, the future. I also believe that we have a lot more work to do to fully understand the impacts of technology. Let me conclude by posing a uh, question. If one supposed as seems natural, that the impact of technology is very profound and is displacing large amounts of labor, particularly less skilled labor, then one would expect that a period when this was happening at an abnormally rapid rate would be a period when productivity was rising abnormally rapidly. Output might or might not rise abnormally rapidly because after all workers are being displaced, but output per worker should be rising very rapidly precisely because of the displacement of workers. Output per worker should be rising very rapidly because the fraction of those who are actually working who are highly skilled is increasing. And so it is a great puzzle that over this period of 10 to 15 years, when these concerns about technological unemployment have become particularly acute, when there's more and more fear about the computer program that reads an X-ray or the uh, driverless or the driverless car or the instant checkout at a uh, supermarket that you can do uh, yourself. The puzzle is that all of this has coincided with very slow, not very rapid uh, productivity uh, growth. Now, one explanation that's frequently given is uh, that technology takes a long time to have an impact on productivity because it takes a long time to be fully assimilated. And that story is told with respect to the introduction of electricity at the beginning of the 20th century. It's told with respect to the first wave of computer technologies. And people always reference uh, Bob Solo's famous 1987 remark that the uh, computer is everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And so the argument is that technology will generate productivity growth, it just hasn't yet. That may be right. The reason it's not fully satisfactory as an explanation of the paradox I have described, though, is that if technology has not yet generated productivity, it's hard to see why it should yet have generated mass disemployment. Indeed, 
if the technologies take a long time to install and understand, you might expect that they would generate extra, uh, extra employment during the transition as both existing processes were carried on and new technologies were installed. So I think there is a great puzzle uh, as to how to reconcile the technological impact on inequality with the technological lack of impact on uh, productivity. If I understood that puzzle better and with more conviction, I would be able to have more confidence in thinking about the economic policy challenge uh, that, uh, is, uh, that, it, that is posed. But for now, I would offer the tentative, uh, I would offer these uh, four uh, tentative judgments. One, resisting technology cannot be the answer. Uh, technology has vast potential for the betterment of human lives, and its resistance is almost certainly going to be a mistake. Two, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. And so those who believe there is no fundamental discontinuity, I think have a very substantial chance of being in error. Whether this is whether this is already pervasive, whether it will be pervasive uh, before long, I believe that uh, when historians in 2200 look back at uh, this uh, moment, they will regard this as having been a moment not unlike the Industrial Revolution of a very profound uh, change. Third, uh, I suspect that this is going to require a substantial increase in the and re redefinition and reformulation um, of the activities of uh, the uh, public sector. The truth is we are moving towards an economy where that which can be produced um, with the standard factory envisioned in an introductory economics textbook is becoming very cheap. The price of television sets as measured in the US Consumer Price Index is 1 16th of what it was 30 years ago. In contrast, the price of healthcare is six times what it was uh, 30 uh, years ago, marking nearly a hundredfold change in relative uh, prices. This is going to require substantial adaptation, and I would guess ultimately uh, enlargement uh, in uh, the public sector. Fourth, I suspect uh, that uh, we are going to look forward to a day when at least a large fraction of the population, substantial fraction of the population will be spending more time not at work than has been the case historically. And the question of how people who are not working will find stability, fulfillment, and purpose in their lives is, I think, a large question for us all to contemplate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Larry. We really appreciate it. Safe, safe travels today and, and good luck this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating stuff. Hopefully we will.